Historically, speed of delivery wasn't a core capability for banks. If everyone else was as slow as you were, it didn't matter how slow you were. With the arrival of the first fintechs, suddenly people began to see that things could be done differently. It is absolutely true that the new players have been reshaping the expectations of the average consumer. Like the world changed when people started using smartphone apps. They enabled you to build experiences like you pull your phone out and you push a button and a car picks you up and takes you somewhere, like Uber. You know, Monzo and Starling and, and Oak North and others wanted to bring that same low friction experience to your bank account. Customers expect more in a truly digital world, and fintechs are redefining customer service in banking, scaling rapidly, and starting to take market share from the big banks. But what is a fintech? The term fintech is somewhat overloaded. What it really means is an organization, typically a startup, that is designed to bring new customer propositions to the financial market using modern software development processes. A fintech is this, is this weird sort of startup where it's a tech company that, that also has sort of T-shaped skills in, in, in regulation and in, in finance. Fintechs are sort of like this bridge between the, the consumer experience that consumers want and demand and the regulated, slow and very, very high friction services that actually underpin all of the financial services systems in the UK. The other main difference between fintechs and banks is the way that software is actually deployed. Fintechs are native uh, internet companies. They're designed to deploy software on a continuous basis. So they typically build very small pieces of software, roll that out, and a deployment process might take a matter of minutes. So therefore you can deploy 10, 20, 30, you know, 100 times a day. Banks, however, are very large and monolithic. They want to deploy the entire stack in one go. That's a massive operation and it can typically take two, three, weeks, maybe even months. As a result, fintechs can grow and enhance their product very, very quickly. Banks take a lot longer to do it. The real difference when you start looking at a fintech to a big bank is really the, the facilitation of speed. And this is really the major difference that we're seeing in the banks right now. If a Monzo or a Revolut can deploy code to live even 80 or 90 times a day in some instances if they really have to, um, then a big sales cycle or a big change cycle for of two to three months of a deployment for a big bank, then actually the places that we're going to get apart become more and more fundamental in the market as it goes on. But what was the change in the market that facilitated the entry of fintechs? What were the factors that made their presence possible? In summary, what happened was that the UK post the financial crisis made it a lot easier to set up financial challenger propositions. You know, the FCA and the Sandbox facilitated the growth of it. The changes that really enabled new banks and new fintechs, a lot of them came from regulation. A lot of them were, you could get new banking licenses. Um, things like the FCA Innovate program that, that Fronted's a member of made it possible to, to try out new things and to try out new products in a way that it wasn't just going to be like, oh, that's never been done before, therefore it's illegal. Um, so regulation has a huge effect. The competition mandate was launched in the UK by the FCA in the wake of the 2008 crisis to reduce the big bank's chokehold on the market and allow for new players to come through. The FCA also champions Sandboxes, a new initiative that has become the blueprint for regulators around the world, where firms can test their services in a safe and regulated environment before launching publicly. This has made regulators seem less intimidating and more welcoming to change. Regulation has always been a barrier of entry, but actually with the advent of everything that we were seeing under that competition mandate, then organizations were able to come to the market easier than ever before. And now in the UK and actually Europe more broadly, we have a real plethora of options of actually how to get a financial instrument to market, you know, using e-money licenses, using PISPs for open banking access, or, you know, applying and gaining access to a full banking license. So with that options, and actually with easier ways of getting to market, that's how we've really seen the, the, the competition space really, really heat up. Fintechs are charging into the market as a result of competition mandates and lowered barriers to entry. But it was not just the regulation change that opened the door for them. There were several factors at play beyond financial services that created a perfect storm for fintechs to thrive. When the global financial crisis hit in 2008, uh, what actually was happening at the same time technologically is cloud was emerging to become a major force of change uh, as a technology along with the smartphone network. 
and the release of the iPhone followed by all of the other smartphones, the 5G networks, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, the API banking and open banking ecosystem has fundamentally changed the whole way in which banking is constructed. If fintechs are leveraging all this new technology to help them build their products differently, move at speed and gain customers, why can't the banks do the same? Big banking systems were traditionally siloed by product. This worked well for banks to adhere to regulation per product, but for a customer, it can be frustrating. The same bank who offered you a credit card will have no idea who you are when you go to apply for a mortgage. And in the middle of all these silos was the mainframe, where all transactions were logged and every 24 hours the ledgers were updated. So if you wanted to add something new, it had to be built on top of this 24-hour spaghetti legacy system. And therefore, it's harder for the traditional banks to take advantage of the new technology. Additionally, over time, so much governance was applied to their processes that banks became extremely risk-averse and therefore very hesitant adopters of new technologies, such as cloud. There will always be you know, a circumspect lag among financial institutions, rightly so, to ensure that they're not violating their responsibilities um, as regulated entities in adopting new technologies. This is the same thing uh, that we, we've seen in terms of their uh, take on cloud, and that has transformed over the last 10 years. It was like, no, I'm not putting all my stuff out in the open public cloud. I'm not going to do that. Now they understand that, if configured correctly, that is absolutely the best way to operate a financial institution. While banks are now coming round to the benefits of cloud, fintechs were usually built cloud native. Before the invention of cloud computing, you had to buy a big expensive mainframe, and it could take six months of work and planning to procure, set up, and start using it. However, fintechs who were often smaller startups who wanted to get to market quickly and scale up as they want, didn't have the time or money for that. Therefore, they were keen adopters of cloud computing, where they could lease time on other people's hardware and scale their service up as they went, giving them more flexibility and less expense up front. The cloud opened up new opportunities, not just in terms of speed and agility, but also how the bank itself was built and set up and could deploy its features. When you split things out like that, when you build a bigger distributed system, you can deploy smaller changes. And smaller changes mean that you, know, you might deploy to production 50 to 100 times a day instead of you know, once a quarter. And the nice thing about deploying small changes is that if something goes wrong, it's only a very, very small job to roll it back. On top of this new processing power in the cloud, fintechs began to take advantage of modern day APIs. These provided them with access to established systems, such as card networks and payment rails, that otherwise they would not have been able to reach. You go through these waves where infrastructure companies come along and they sort of build the infrastructure and then people build brands on top of that. Currency Cloud was an app that let you do FX, so um, foreign exchange, and TransferWise was originally built on top of Currency Cloud. Um, Monzo and Revolut all got started on top of GPS. Another important building block that fintechs can leverage is open source software. This is free to use open code or software, some of which are built by the biggest organizations on the planet and iterated over time to become market leading. This provides fintechs with a foundation of powerful code and programs that they could build up and adapt for their needs without having to start from scratch. And so a lot of modern technology companies, banks included, are built on top of this sort of distributed systems technology that's been released by companies like Google. When I left Monzo, there was, not, there was no proprietary technology in Monzo at all. Everything from you know, the Linux kernel that ran on the machines to Kubernetes that ran on top of that, which is open sourced by Google, to the very language that Monzo's written in, which is Go, which is open sourced by Google. And on top of that was all the microservices stuff that we sort of built ourselves. So you're really standing on the shoulders of giants. So banks that you know, might have been standing on the shoulders of giants like IBM before um, are now sort of like being left behind by banks that are standing on the shoulders of giants like Google. Fintechs have combined a range of technologies with cloud computing to help them get to market quickly and move at speed. And fundamentally, the ways of building a banking core has been completely revolutionized. It's exactly the same requirements and capabilities that happen in the enterprise world, but it's just done at far higher scale. And weirdly, it's allowed you to do it cheaper, quicker and safer. Kind of the ultimate oxymoron. Those things like the cloud and distributed systems and microservices and DevOps have allowed the banks that came after 
their sort of regulatory change to move a lot faster and to develop product faster and to get things into market faster. It's now becoming easier, cheaper, faster and better to run a financial institution. The bad news is those same technological uh, uh, breakthroughs in terms of the internet and cloud infrastructure make it is easy for almost any company, whether they have a charter or a license or not, to offer the things that chartered entities offer. So while it's cheaper, easier, faster, better to run a bank these days, you are also now up against a much broader field of competitors who are not necessarily playing the same game that you are as a chartered financial service provider. Everything is, is fundamentally uh, adopting digital at a, a faster pace than financial services is, therefore it really sticks out. Like technology is changing the world so quickly now that eventually every industry gets disrupted. Finance is having its nap at the moment, you know. With the technological and regulatory changes, any company can become a fintech company and the banking battlefield has really opened up. The challenge for the traditional banks just got bigger.